I'm Gabe Zickerman, and we're here on the Gamification Revolution with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being here at G Summit 2014. So, tell me this. This is the big question that's like burning on my mind right now. Why is it so hard to get people to care about math and science? Oh, I've thought about that, and I have an answer that I don't know if it'll satisfy you, but it's my answer. Okay, I'll take it. I think we we're misguided about how to accomplish it. We think let's be cheerleaders for them, let's, let's improve the teaching, let's make better schools, better classrooms. And, and I'm reminded of a quote from Antoine saint Exupéry, who is a, an aviator, mm -hmm. a French aviator. Mm -hmm. Perhaps best known, I mean in the aerospace industry we know him as an aviator, but for most of the world he's perhaps best known as the author of The Little Prince, mm -hmm. uh, who went on a spaceship around visiting asteroids and planets. So he commented that if you want to teach someone to build a ship, you do not gather them up and show them where the nails are and how to use a hammer and how to saw wood. No, no. Instead, you train them to long for the immensity of the open seas. Mm. It's the longing that creates the innovation, that stimulates the innovation, that gets people interested in a topic. If you think you're going to just come at it at the root and believe that somehow you will create inspiration for an entire generation of people, I don't know that that has any precedent in the history of civilization. So when I, I'm old enough, older than you. But you look great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember having been a kid in the 1960s, and it wasn't about, no, that was a turbulent decade, remember. It was, you know, had a hot war in Southeast Asia, and a cold war with the Soviet Union, and the civil rights movement was still in full motion, and, and there was campus unrest and civil unrest, yet we were going to the moon. That was a force of nature unto itself, mm. where you knew innovations in science and technology were required to make that happen. You knew this, and you knew that we had the capacity to build a future commensurate with our dreams. And so you say, I want to study science. I want to study chemistry. I want to study materials. I, I, want, I, I want to be a part of that. And that was a force operating that it's greater that, than, in my judgment, anything that can happen just sitting around a table. So Peter Thiel, who's this uh, famous billionaire co-founder of PayPal, has talked about this uh, expectation gap for people who grew up in the 60s because it was we were going to go to space and by the way the 60s uh, in the 60s we had the Jetsons yeah we had Star Trek which is arguably the most successful entertainment genre I'm a huge no, fan. No, I mean, uh, a, a, a franchise yeah. there ever was yep uh, in all the incarnations on television and all the movies and right. second generation of movies that was conceived and born in the 60s sure and something that's not widely appreciated about the Star Tri Starship Enterprise may I share it of course I'm a big enough nerd that I care okay but I was at a Comic Con at the Starship Smackdown and I spoke up on behalf of the original Starship Enterprise oh gee I think that was the first ship portrayed in a science fiction story that was not built for a destination. Hmm. Interesting. It was built for you to live on it. Any other ship you've seen, we're, using it to, we're going to take this to, a Mar to Mars or an asteroid or to another planet. Then you get off the ship and then that's it. You lived on that. You lived on the SS Enterprise. That vision imagined space as our backyard, as the natural place we would be. And we were all embedded in that state of mind. It wasn't just the drugs of the 60s <laughs> that was imagining. Not just the drugs. Not just the drugs. Right. Uh, so, so, so tell me more about so, so Peter, his thinking. So Peter's thing, which I think was very interesting, a little controversial, is that if you'd projected out our rate of technological advance and our achievements from that point forward, you know, by now, the Jetson should be somewhat more real. And so he talks a lot about how we don't think big enough anymore and how people are, uh, even their startup ideas are pretty small. It's like, oh, here's my startup idea to make this widget a little bit better. Well, how do we get Why people- Why is that controversial? Well, how do we get people to Why think Why is like he controversial? 
he's controversial for other reasons. Oh, he thinks we should live on islands and okay. not go to school. But let's set that aside for a second. <laughs> okay. How do you? I don't, anything you just told me about what seems he said pretty does rational, not right? sound controversial so at all. How do we reignite people's passion? Then you've talked a lot about this passion. How do we actually go from where we are now to that point? Well, we have to remember why we were in that state of mind in the '60s. We were at war. And as much as we want to believe, as Americans, that it was our destiny to go to the moon, or that it was in our DNA, or that it's human nature to want to explore, or that Kennedy had charisma, we can tell ourselves this. Mm -hmm. But if you actually part the curtains and analyze what actually happened, we went to the moon because we were at war. And when you're at war, money flows like rivers. You feel threatened. Sputnik was orbiting overhead. We remember ourselves as pioneers in that era. What does a pioneer? It means you do stuff first. Well, let's analyze that. Who was the first in space with anything? Russia with Sputnik. Who was the first, what was the first animal in space? A non-human animal, it was a dog, like right, it, like Russia. That. All right, we finally would get an animal up, then a non-human, then a human animal. And every achievement that we accomplished in space was either in reaction to something Russia already did, Soviet Union, right? or in reaction to something they said they were going to do. Everything. So you're saying we should go to war with someone. Oh No, what I'm saying is that war created a, 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 a byproduct of that engagement, which was a technological show, display. It was peacock feathers displaying technology. Right. Okay? And who's got the biggest peacock feathers? Combine that with the ICBMs and the missile silos, and you've got a full-up, you know, pissing contest. All right. So, so here's the here's the rub. We go into space because of war. Yet, it has these other tandem benefits that no one had imagined for it. Boosting our economy, stimulating a we we ha, we were in a way an innovation nation. You didn't have to wait too long before something new would be invented that would transform how you lived, okay? A little bit of that happens today, but it's a small scale. Oh, what's the new app on my iPhone or the new this? There's, there are no major advances in transportation or energy or, or the structure of cities or, or you know, they're made, I'm talking about major changes empowered by innovations. Where are they? Are we even thinking that way? I claim that if we go back into space, but leave the war part out of it, we can still get another generation of benefits that will completely drive an economy that would fully have justified that expense in the first place. Well, we had just yesterday here at G Summit, speaker from the XPRIZE Foundation, Eileen Bartholomew was here, and she is responsible for the prizes at the XPRIZE, and they of course gave out the famous Ansari XPRIZE that led to the creation of Spaceship One, uh, that put that team into space, and now Virgin Galactic and SpaceX is an Oh, by the way, just, yeah. just to clarify. Yes. Just to clarify. Yes. If clarify. you have a schoolroom globe, yeah. and you can ask, where is that Spaceship One at its highest altitude, where everyone says it went into space. I'm where is you, it? This is the globe. My so, no, no, foot across schoolroom globe. Okay. Okay. So, they say they went into space. Let's back up. You know Felix Bumgarner's jump from the edge of space? Okay. The, the Red Bull yes, advertising thing? Mm -hmm. Edge of space? Mm -hmm. All right. Where's that? Let's, let's, look, let's, scale, it, let's scale it. Okay, right? I'm going to make the globe. You, you got the globe. You show me on your hands. Oh, well, it's Get hard there. because I can't bring my fingers that close together without touching. All right. <laughs> Felix Bumgarner jumped one sixteenth of an inch away from Earth's surface okay. if Earth were a schoolroom globe. Okay. The space shuttle orbits three eighths of an inch. So and you're we, advocating And we call that bigger. space. You even called space, what Spaceship One did, space. I'm just saying, it's not space. Not so space. much. Okay. Not so much. Near Earth orbit. Can we go with near Earth orbit? But Spaceship One wasn't even in orbit. It okay. just went, it was a joyride up, up and down. down. It was a, that's right, barely even suborbital. So one of the things that Eileen was talking about, I'm curious to hear your opinion, is this idea that... I don't, I don't give opinions. Okay. I offer perspectives that you might not have had in the shaping of your own opinion, and then I walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and lead That's, me to contemplate what And you happened. contemplate well, okay, the wait. added information that you had been neglecting. So let's, let's... If it's something that I've thought deeply about, I'm going to do that 
on the spot. Okay. If I haven't thought deeply about it, I got nothing to say. And why would I have an opinion? So let's let's talk Too about your perspective. Too many people have opinions about stuff they haven't thought deeply about. Let's That's take one of the big problems in the world. I agree. Okay, I'll shut up. Go. Let, no, let's talk about your <laughs> let's talk about your perspective shaping for a second because actually for sure. that is actually something we're super interested mm-hmm. in. So I think of you because I'm trying to avoid have, saying yeah. something. So I don't agree with you. Let's agree to disagree. That, what's the point of that conversation, other than to try to influence somebody else of your opinion that you can't fully defend? What's the point of that? Well, that's why I don't give opinions. So your approach. I think overall is actually very influential. And part of the reason why I'm so excited to have you here and why everyone's so excited to have you here is that I think singular, I believe singularly, you've been able to get people engaged with the topic of space. You're very engaging. What's the kind of approach that you take to taking the material, to making these ideas uh, compelling for people who want to, uh, for people who want to be as compelling as you are you in their the, field? You want to know the secret? I love all secrets. Okay, as long as you don't tell anybody. Uh, some people okay. might hear this. I cherry pick. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, I spend enough of my brain power engaged in pop culture to get some sense of what pop culture values, what pop culture thinks about, what titillates them. And so I comb the universe for all that's out there. And there's some really boring stuff out there. Oh, yeah. you, you won't care how you know, how spectral line features are formed in the underlayers of the solar atmosphere. I mean, maybe I could get you to be interested in it, but I wouldn't expect that. Way more interesting is how you get ripped apart atom by atom as you fall into a black hole feet first. Definitely. So I cherry pick that. And if it ever comes up in conversation, that's what I share with people. And that, in some cases, ignites a flame. In other cases, it fans a flame that was already there. But in all cases, it, if I succeed, stimulates the person to pursue the topic further. What is education if not getting someone to want to learn more? You can't teach everybody everything they'll ever know. Well, we'd all be dead. I mean, you couldn't, there's no, teachers don't have that kind of energy. But to become a fully informed person requires more than the time you spent in classroom. It requires some curiosity that's been stimulated by the time you spent in classroom. And, well, and one of the challenges that a lot of folks here at G Summit deal with is trying to educate older, like adults, who are employees of their companies or who need to understand this kind of stuff. What do you think about the difference between the adult learning style and the child's learning style as you relate to them? Because uh, adults love your work. You're not speaking primarily to children, I don't think. What's different about that? Well, there's two. There, you have two problems convolved into one question. Okay. One of them is the fact that anybody over 60 did not grow up with a computer, all right? Or maybe even over 50. They did not grow up with a computer. So there are things intuitive to a 15-year-old or even a 10-year-old that are a major thought process for someone who's 65 or 70 or 75. So you have a generation gap brought about by a technology gap. Then you have the simple, are you ossified in your thinking as an adult relative to the pliability of the learning mind of a child? Both of those are sort of conflated in that question. So do you want to unpack that into two variables? Sure. Or you want me to try to answer them as one? Sure, you can, you can answer them however you think <laughs> is best to I don't have a silver bullet for getting an older generation to just get really comfortable with computers and wanting, you know, we probably can all, if you had a nickel for every time you spoke to an older person, I'm happy with this, I don't need to upgrade my system, sure. I'm happy printing out my photos, why do I need it faster, why do I need, you know, there's this questioning of the moving frontier of technology. And, well, I, I, I've basically just given up. <laughs> I just, I said, okay, fine, fine, but I'm going to do this this way and you'll just watch. Like, you can't twist someone's arm sure. to get them to upgrade their system. But you can walk by them with your system open and they can watch cool things happen and, and that might pique their interest and then later they'll knock on the door to learn how to do it. Are they applauding me? Yes, no, no. actually. <laughs> that was like an amazing cue from God. <laughs> right. Uh, and so uh, now the, the other gap is, you know, can adults be ossified or not? I think we live in an era where no longer do you have ossified adults in the workplace. They would have lost their job long ago because the rate of change of what you have to do to stay economically competitive 
in a business environment is such that if you don't have, if you're not pliable in your methods, tools, and 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 expectations, you're gone. Can we teach that kind of pliability to kids and adults? Do you believe that that, no, 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 no. So that, that flexibility can that be That kind taught? of pliability they're born into. They'll say, okay, I want a job and I'm gonna switch the job in three years and go to another job. And then I'm gonna learn something different. This is the state of mind now. Our parents, you worked in, you, you got out of college or high school, you worked for one company the rest of your life. Oh yeah, my dad worked for his employer for 40 years. 40 years. That never will never happen. You say that to our kids, like, what? They yeah. look at you like, what's wrong with you, 40 years? So I think it's built in that they're not, th that they have to be fresh in their awareness and their exposure. Uh, I, so I'm not worried as much about them as I was about us and our generation getting caught in that transition between the loyal employer and the employer who says, look, I'm not even giving you uh, benefits. So what about if we have to Employment teach? Benefits. What about if we have to get people to do or learn things which are fairly boring as part of the process of being inspired and wanting to build oh, Saint? I would I would say that the burden of boredom, the burden of non board domity. It's a good word. I'll, go, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, the burden to make something not boring is entirely on the shoulders of the of the instructor. So. Entirely, entirely, and I would say. Oh, you're saying what? Well, you have to teach something boring. No, you don't. Find something interesting about it. Make it so interesting that they'll want to learn what on the front side of that might have seemed boring. But once you've learned the whole context, it fits right in. You say, I want as much as I can get. And you end up learning everything. You know what that's like? Mm. That's like falling in love with a musical performer off of the greatest hits and say, now show me the stuff that's between the other tracks. Show me the things that never actually hit number one because it's not really right. that good. The B side. Or the B the, the B tracks. They're right. not it's not really that good to the pop consumer. But if you're so into what they're doing, you'll say, Oh, this is where he took the track this way and that way. And you'll become a fan of it, even though that material was less celebrated or less famous, less um, it didn't chart. So uh, it's entirely the dude that I got in trouble. In my Twitter stream, you're not the first. Okay, <laughs> I said I don't remember the exact wording. It was better in the tweet than I can possibly because my tweets are very brain. It's like brain dumping. Uh, no, no, no. Well, yes, there's that. But once I dump the brain, then it's I feel like a sculptor because every word has to match and go, and I want to make sure that the word sequence has a certain rhythm. Yes. Part of that the is, challenge of that is That is, makes you want to read it. Now, of course, it's only 140 characters. It's not a, a novel. But still, if I can swap words back and forth for the ease of your reading and for your enjoyment, I will do so. So, I, so my tweet that got me in trouble was, is he running out of tape? No. You're hoping he's running out of no, tape no. just at this moment? <laughs> this moment is when everything just fails? Plus, they're not using tape anyway. Yeah. Uh, so... So I said, why is it that you're more likely to hear a teacher say, these students don't want to learn, than you are to hear the teacher say, I suck at my job. And why do you think that's, why do you believe that? Uh, no one ever wants to say that about their own talent set that actually often requires a third party to make that assessment. So uh, then people wrote in, so he, how could he say that? He's never taught. It, they obviously clearly didn't look at my CV, which is completely posted on my website, all right? Well, I think you do nothing. I mean, in my mind, you mostly teach. Well, they're thinking in the classroom, right, and sure. just because it's easy to sit in front of a camera lens and pontificate and pass judgment on those who are in a classroom. Um, so no, but I was, I've been there. Really, and so, so whether or not that statement, that tweet, is true, one hundred percent, it is true enough, so that as a teacher, you should at least go there. Say to yourself, maybe I'm not good enough. How can I get even better? Because it's all too easy to say these students don't want to learn. That's too, that's easy to say. 
So one last question for you that I have. What do you think about, uh, from your perspective, what do you think about the difference between uh, incentivizing somebody to do something, especially as it relates to learning, and not incentivizing them to do something? I know you talk a lot about Not this. incentivizing or de-incentivizing them? Well, okay, great. That's so three aspects of it. Let's, taking this broad perspective, you're clearly very inspirationally oriented and you really help people see the world, I think, in a big way many practitioners of, especially training practitioners, educators, they're like, that's awesome, Dr. Tyson, but I got a class to teach, I got scores I need to meet, I've got to get my students out this way, I got my employees to achieve this and this and this line item on my checklist of stuff they've got to do. How do we take that, how do we take that idea and actually move that in a practical way in your mind? Yeah, that's the, that's the greatest challenge in any state, in any system, is you can have your philosophy of how it should work, and now what is what are the details? As they say, God is in the, or the devil. Both have been your seen. Choice. Both yeah. of them have been seen in the details. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so, and and I recognize and respect that challenge, but that shouldn't stop you from being guided by it as a mission statement, because when it when it operates on you as a mission statement. It helps you get through the details. You can say, oh, I just reminded myself why I'm doing this. Because we want to inspire people so that they'll want to learn on their own. So as you're gr grinding through the paper grading as a teacher or fixing the lesson plan or meeting with students, you, you get to resort. You, you, no, not resort. You get to um, reach back for that mission statement and say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it. Maybe I can do this even better tomorrow. And so that can be a potent force of inspiration on someone who's actually trying to get the job done, I have found. So uh, in a curriculum that everyone is forced to teach because it's handed from up on high, mm -hmm. like I said, I would cherry pick the curriculum Knowing that that will get them excited, then go back in and fill in the gaps. And do this. Stuff, and then stuff. do that. That's correct. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tyson. Well, can, can I give you a quick example? Of course you can. You Absolutely. This is, a, this is a contrived example, but it's what I mean. You're learning astronomy. You say, okay, um, what, uh, what is the shape of Earth's orbit around the sun? Okay. So I'll say, well, it's a circle. It's a circle. It's okay, can you draw a circle? Yeah, sure. Okay. Got that? Yeah, I got it. I, okay. You know, it's not actually a circle. Earth spends some time closer to the sun than other times. So take that circle and squeeze it a little bit. Oh, I didn't know that. What happens when we're close? Is that summer? No, no it's not. We get summer for another reason. All of a sudden, the fact of doing this created questions within them that I didn't even have to put in. Right. If we're closer, what does that mean for Earth? Okay, so now you have what's called, and I give it a word, an ellipse. Okay. You got that? An ellipse. All right. Got it. Uh, when are we closest to the sun? Actually, we're closest January 3rd, when it's winter here. By the way, of course, Southern Hemisphere, it's summer. Sure. Okay, all right. You got the ellipse? Say yes. Got it. Okay. It's not actually an ellipse. What? I know. You're messing with my mind. I know. See, now you, now you want to know. Yeah. Right? There's a yeah. curiosity. Yeah. It's not just, oh, do I have to memorize this? All of a sudden, we are leaning in to each other in the table, wanting to get this, get this knowledge out there. Okay? Right. So, Earth and the Moon. Oh, we think the Moon orbits the Earth. We'd say that. But that's not what actually happens. Earth and the Moon orbit a common center of gravity. So the moon does the heavy lifting out there, of course, but Earth does this in response to the moon. So really, the center of the Earth does not follow an ellipse. The center of the Earth does loop-de-loops around the sun. That's what it does. And it comes right on back. And so there you have your orbit. It's not even that. You know what happened? By the time it comes around, it is not in exactly the same place it was when it left off a year ago. There's a mismatch. The entire system, with every loop, is turning around the sun. Right. 
We call that precession. All of these are happening simultaneously, and that's Earth's orbit around the sun. So there's a lot. Of, there's actually a lot of parallels in that to the way that people learn actually in games. And I would claim right. that these details are something you've earned once you got through the easy layers. Right. Again, the, when you program a game, if the person earned the right to get someplace deep, you give them something more. That's right. Yeah. Because exactly. they're going to go after it. Right. It's you got them. How did they get there? They they busted their ass to get there. Now you give them more. They've earned it. Very cool. And I just took you to the actual shape of Earth's orbit around the sun. Which, by the way, I didn't know until today. Thank you so much, Dr. Tyson, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gabe Zickerman. This has been the Gamification Revolution. We'll see you again soon. Keep having fun, everyone.